Welcome to the episode. I don't even know what this episode's about. It's a surprise to me. Like you, you, the viewer, have more of the info than me because you'll have seen the like the title and thumbnail. But yeah, I'm dropping this on Cyber Show. I did not tell him what we were going to be talking about today, but I think it's interesting enough to kind of riff off it. I have like one little morsel of information, and based on that, I, I know it's the kind of thing people on the internet like to hear about. You know, everyone talks about Christian, and everyone talks about Christian's story. So I thought it'd be interesting to not talk about that, and instead talk about the documentaries about Chris Chan. Damn, that's uh, that's another level of being meta. And I, I have some knowledge on this, but I keep going. I want to hear what you're saying. I think Chris Chan is probably the most famous lol cow out there. Most documented person in modern history. That's the meme, right? Yeah, the whole thing. People is like, most documented person in human history. I don't think that's true. Most documented person on the internet, probably true. Maybe. I mean, most like... It's actually possible the amount of, because the amount of like obsessives, like normal people, I mean, it depends on if you're willing to draw the line for like a celebrity versus an e-celebrity. I don't really know. I guess it is entirely contentious and almost, it's unfalsifiable basically. I mean, I'm sure there's some pedantic people out there like, well, there's, I'm sure we could track down every citation, but you know what I mean? I, uh, I know what you mean. I know what you mean in terms of like, I mean, everyone knows, we just get right into it. Everyone knows about the Gino Samuel doc series. That thing is gargantuan. Yeah, I, was going to, I was going to ask, which ones have you watched? Have you only watched the Gino Samuel one? I, you know, it's funny, most of my actual all, old knowledge about the whole Chris Chan situation comes from like reading the quickie, like literally a decade ago, before, you know, but now I, I I only sort of hear about stuff through the grapevine, but I'm aware of that one. I know that there's been others. I know Turkey Tom just put out like a three hour long Chris Chan video. And when that came out, I thought you might have contributed to it, but I just, I asked you and you did, did not. You did not. I had no involvement. It is, um, it, this is just, just a funny subject because it is, it is a very meta subject, but it is, it is interesting interesting where just to think on a philosophical level every time you're a documentarian of some kind you know you can you affect the story insofar as you can not only just like reaching out even just talking to christian affects a story but just the way you tell it the ways you decide to tell it affects the public perception i don't know you can kind of track how this um objective kind of view of the whole situation where it's not really a lot of the people who who learn about christian aren't coming in thinking this is just purely funny like i'm just gonna laugh at chris a lot of it is kind of an objective wow this is like a horrifying inner that tail, right? That is an interesting aspect, I think, because for a very long time, like, talking about like, like you see on like the something awful forums, people will just mention Sonichu, they mention Chris Chan as like a laugh. Nobody took it seriously, which again, I know some of this sounds like obvious, but like nowadays people, a lot of people only know Chris Chan as like this stalking victim. Like I think there's a lot of normies who only heard like the most fucked up shit when that was breaking news. You know what I mean? And a lot of people yeah. have a different, uh, it's just a different vibe about the whole thing. I don't know. This isn't me like excusing all previous harassment or whatever, but it was just, it felt so much less fucked up and hateful like 10 years ago. It just felt like, haha, we're just keeping track of a weirdo online and they're the one putting all this like stuff out there voluntarily and we're just reacting to it it wasn't like they're like pulling you know like web out of a spider or something you know what yeah, I mean? exactly i kind of want to go into that at the end kind of go right. more into reflecting on all of the differences and how people view chris chan and the differences and how people discuss chris chan but the reason why specifically i'm choosing the documentaries is because i think you can very you can track very well how that perception slowly morphed and and the state it is today. And I want to call into question a lot of things regarding just kind of first the notion that like a documentary about Christian can be objective because you, it can be. It's, it's more interesting to discuss the nuance of that by nature of how the information was collected. But these are again, these are things I want to go into later. Right now, I just kind of want to emphasize the reason why Christian is in the position that she is today is because of the evolution and the influx of documentaries. So I think it'd be interesting to just talk about that trend and how it's kind of indicative and almost probably responsible for the state now. It's definitely interesting because I feel like in the early days, it was so much more like Chris was such a less sympathetic figure in the early days, especially because like some of the earliest, earliest stuff was like Chris Chan, like I hate homos, you know, stuff like that. So every people came in to it almost with like a, ooh, we're allowed to bully this person because they're wrong. You know what I mean? Because so much of the information was, you know, collected, tracked as the only reason any of it even survived is because of like the quickie, you know what I mean? But the quickie is not like a neutral source. The quickie was made to bully Chris, you know, it was made to troll Chris. It was not, it was never an objective thing. Like originally back then, especially, it was documenting all this information that Chris didn't want out there, but also putting in like lies to trick Christine. It was incredibly antagonistically written, you know what I mean? Very antagonistically written. And also they would have fake profiles about the trolls and sometimes even fake articles about like, I think there was at one 
one point they put a fake article up claiming to have put a spy device in uh, one of her like <laughs> playstations or something and so she broke it with a hammer yeah again it's it's meta in a weird sense people when you say meta i'm not just talking oh rick and morty jokes where we know we're a cartoon i mean meta in a weird sense where it's like the whole thing is designed to like keep track of and troll one specific person it's like again and this is the most trite observation i know people have made this before but it's very like truman show-esque where it's like it was almost like a self-fulfilling delusion where chris was like oh i've like like even like the decade ago like i have tons of people stalking me like that's why i got kicked out of college you know it's not because of my crazy behavior but now it's like there actually are tons now of people true. stalking. It's actually become true. It's actually so fucked up and weird to think about. So you haven't seen any of the other documentaries except Gina Sam. I haven't really, like, are there other ones specifically you're thinking of? Because that's just the main one. That's the one everyone knows. And I feel like it's almost like that's how like 99% of people even have any knowledge of Chris Chan now is through this one documentary series, which is kind of crazy to me, honestly, because it's like, I know Gino Samuel is, they're on. He's on good terms with Chris, right? Like, I think that's something we'll go into later. I guess, yes. Okay, sorry. I gotta keep trying to jump the gun. But uh, yeah, go ahead. When I first learned about Chris Chan, I found them through a YouTube video. It was just called the Chris Chan Documentary. And this was all the way back in 2015. Oh, I I vaguely remember hearing about this. Maybe I watched it back in the day, but I definitely don't remember it that well. But yeah, it's true that like, it's not like Gino Samuel was the first person to try and make like a documentary on Chris. So before that point, you're right. The entire view of Chris Chan was just a little cow, no sympathy, taking all the information from the quickie and it's all kind of mocking it's it's in like a in a humorous light the first person that i really remember recontextualizing things in that way was sachimo it's really interesting because it's like this two-hour documentary like made for youtube documentary that was made as a high school project like literally made by a high school student and it, it really emphasizes the tragedy of it all like there's comedic moments but he was the first to kind of do a documentary about the whole story and it's not just for laughs it's kind of an objective analytical view Probably in part because it was for school. It is funny to think about that now. It's like everything is about the saga of Chris Chan. Whereas for so long, for me and for a lot of people, it wasn't, it was about Sonic Chu. And like, it was like, that was the stupid memes you were getting seen posted. And it was about like the funny, I mean, I think obviously I was exposed to it as a fucking Sonic dork. So like people, of course, people are going to be poking Sonic Chu related jokes around me all the time. But like people would mostly engage with that. And then they would also be like, oh, but there's also this crazy aspect where, you know, Chris Chan, the person who made it, it used to just be like, oh, they're just autistic or whatever, because they made this funny crossover. And then, oh, here's a few funny real life details. Now it's like Sonic Chu stuff is almost practically an afterthought. Like it's like the starting point of this whole ridiculous like saga. But like to me, that was always the most like amusing thing, specifically just how crazy and insane that comic. Like Ben Saint has a good like series where he just breaks down everything in the comic because the comic Sonic Chu, most people, I mean, I would say like almost every single modern Chris Chan fan has not, not even made an attempt to read the comic. And I understand why, because the comic is a big piece of shit. And it's almost impossible to understand without like the additional context of Chris's life. So I guess that's sort of why that transitioned into that. I don't think most people nowadays take that much interest into Sonichu as anything more than like, because the way people discovered Sonichu was, was this is a cringy comic, let's make fun of this. And then it turns into Chris Chan is as a person is just really weird and kind of like creepy and very gullible and you can convince this person to like drink their own semen and shit just like crazy shit like it quickly definitely the craziness of christine outweighed the craziness of the comics very quickly and i I mean to be fair she like stopped drawing too like that frequently she doesn't really make the comic anymore but right 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 of course like, that does make sense that people wouldn't be talking about it nowadays i guess but like it is just crazy to me like that was the only reason anyone even had heard of chris chan and then it was just like a, it is weird to think like it was just a series of like coincidences like that they got any online attention whatsoever i mean we don't need to go over the whole how they were discovered like all that website stuff but like it is just crazy to me like so easy to imagine we could live in an alternate reality where Chris Chan just never blew up on the internet. They could be posting stuff every day and they just never would get the attention of anyone. Because that's like, I mean, again, again, slightly trite observation, but there's a hundred other Chris Chans. There's like a million other Chris Chans, but just nobody's fucking paying attention to them. You know what I mean? It was like a perfect storm of all these different factors that the recontextualization that would eventually kind of lead to Gino Samuel's project began with like random high school project that just happened to go like it has like two million views now. Sachimo took all of Chris's real life information and also all of the trolling sagas and compiled them in a way where it's it's almost sympathetic because it's talking about how troubled this person's life was and it's to the point where it's kind of like an emphasis on the story of Christine growing up with autism to the point where he even gets an interview with the special ed teacher at his school to talk about Chris. I don't know if there was anything like this for a lol cow at the time. The delineation between a private citizen and like a celebrity like the idea of you can just like call someone's old school and then like chat to their like old teacher about what they were like it's it's strange i have to admit it is like it is peculiar and that is one thing that i guess is 
just trying to wonder if this is like going to become more commonplace in the future as people get more and more fixated on e-celebs or people are going to start stalking every aspect of their life and like making documentaries about them. I, I don't know. I mean, definitely for sure. Nowadays, I think the bar of entry for making a video is a lot lower and there's a lot more people trying to make videos. You know, maybe today something like this would have been drowned out. You know, maybe something like this wouldn't have had the impact it had. But this was the first actual film produced about Chris. It wasn't just gloating about all the ways they trolled this person and all the ways they got one over this person. It was about their childhood. It was about their struggles, their intense lack of social awareness. their like just completely disgusting personal habits. And then contextualizing it with the perspective of someone who is in the field of like special education. It's funny to even have to say it like this, but like, yeah, even having a remotely sympathetic or like, here's why they're, why they're like this angle was seen as like novel at the time because it was mostly just, you know, how can you have a most, it's like I said, it was a best hits compilation of like the most embarrassing moments. That's That would be the obvious go-to back then. I remember first watching this when I was, how, how old? I was like 13 in 2015. I remember first watching this and thinking like, wow, you know, this is funny, but this is also really sad. And this makes me like... <laughs> This makes me really self-conscious about where I'm going to end up, you know, when I'm an adult. It makes me really self-conscious about being kind of antisocial, being too deep into these nerdy interests. It made me very worried. It made me very self-conscious. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people you'll hear now where people basically treat Chris as like, what's the word, like a warning? It's like a cautionary tale. Yeah, yeah cautionary it's absolutely tale. like exactly. if you gaze into the abyss too long, this is what you could end up as. And believe me, as a Sonic fan, I've certainly been like, you know, I had to, I was like, I was about to walk out the house with my pepper spray and go to GameStop. And I saw that video and I was like, damn, I guess I should take it easy on some of this shit. But you know what I mean? It is, it is strange. Like I said, if somehow you're like watching this, you never even heard of Chris Chan. First of all, this episode's gonna be incomprehensible to you. But second of all, again, like I said, the angle of even having to be like, oh, sympathetic, like angle being as unique is like, it really was sort of at the time, you know, that was really one way a lot of people were looking at it was like, oh, wow. I, genuinely, I do posit a lot of it to Satchimo. I, I, I would attribute a lot of it. Maybe I'm wrong. There probably were people who were viewing it that way, but I just, I don't remember it being as prevalent until his video kind of exposed a lot more people to these, this entire saga. That was the first video that I remember outlined all of the sagas clearly in a presentable, digestible video that you could just watch, you know? Right. For a long time, like the only people who really knew about Chris Chan were total fucking freaks like myself, who at the time read the wiki about the whole situation. And, and you know, yeah, the idea of compressing it into like an understandable condensed form that people could sort of digest it. They wouldn't have to necessarily have an in-depth like saga knowledge to, you know, relate to this person was because back at the time, believe me, over the de past decade or however long it's been, I've seen many, many, many Chris Chan threads and like the amount of defenders. Well, there literally were none ever for like the first however many years. You know what I mean? There was no the idea of being a Chris Chan defender didn't really make any sense. <laughs> it was the start of people trying to figure out how Chris became the way she became. It was the start of people trying to see how much autism actually played a part in it, how much her upbringing actually played a part in it and the kind of inherent sadness to someone who is never going to grow up. Right. For a long time, it was all just about the cringe culture. Look at this, how cringe this is. It pointed at the cringe thing and laugh, but there was never, basically never, like any sort of genuine attempt to understand the art behind the cringe, the artist behind the piece itself, as it were. I and mean, it's funny because the first person to do it was like this high school kid who had to do it for class. Like he basically like, you know, you can't just present like this movie that's like, fuck this person. This person's a fucking loser. Let's, let's bully them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> he can't he came away with this very interesting perspective ultimately that I genuinely I do think Without it, I don't think we would have Geno Samuels' eventual take on it, which was three years after. Because the whole thesis of Geno Samuels, like the intro, is like what made him this way. You know, what is the, what is the fascination and all that? I, I don't think we'd have arrived at that point without the original Sachimo documentary. It sounds kind of insane to even posit that it could be remotely, quote unquote, progressive to make a full documentary about someone who's like, you know, obviously there's arguments to be made that, you know, no matter how, no matter how you frame your your documentary, Gino Samuels or his, you're still making a documentary about Chris Chan, which perpetuates the problem. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's truly I don't know if there's like a, a good way <laughs> to cover this. Right, right. Like, this story is always just going to be kind of fucked. Like no matter which way you kind of try to drive it, there's never going to be a happy ending. I mean, obviously right. now, but even back then, there was never going to be like a happy ending to the story. Yes. If I had some sort of godlike powers and I could have just 
like 10 years ago, like 2013, 2014 era, everyone could have, should have just given up, completely gotten bored with Chris, zero people following Chris online. That like That's like the happy ending that we, that's like the closest to a happy ending we could have gotten. But no, unfortunately, I've just had to accept the fact that I, I mean, it would be, if I could just press a button and it would be like, never, you will never hear anyone mention Chris Chan again for the rest of your natural life. I would happily press that button, but I've just accepted that this is like a thing that I'm going to have to hear people talk about forever. And I, and I incidentally happen to know a lot about it. Not that I'm super proud of that, but uh, yeah, I, I've sort of just had to accept it. There was an element of that with the first documentary, because at that point, I think this was after the house fire and after Bob had passed. So the trolls had largely left Chris alone. People have tried to present different eras as being, okay, it's, it's here this time. Time. It's the end of Chris Tree. It's really over. But people keep that never ha happened, obviously. To be fair, though, I think this was after the GameStop event, which is <laughs> when things kind of right. amped back up. So there's always some inciting incident like that. And to be perfectly clear, I mean, it would take it like a billion years to elucidate all my thoughts, but I'm not like trying to pretend like Chris is some blameless individual or whatever. I'm just saying like, I mean, obviously Christine was like constantly posting shit online, e-begging, like being like, give me money so I can buy new My Little Pony toys. So it's not like, it, it, you it know, it calmed down. It sort of it has calmed down, but it already sort of evolved in this fucked up unhealthy symbiotic relationship where i don't think chris could live like without free money and online attention from these people which was like i think they were just like too used to it at that point but yeah i don't know it definitely wasn't like a weird period of time i have to say now it's interesting okay you have watched the gino samuel documentary I haven't seen every individual piece, but I have seen lots of the individual episodes. I, I basically get the gist of it is to be like, you know, his style. Yeah, I don't I don't follow up with it anymore, personally. It just it goes a little too detailed. Like he's like, and then I'm going to read this part of the quickie and then I'm going to read this part of the quickie. And I'm like, okay, I don't need I don't need some guy to read this. There's, to me. there's a certain point where I think early on it was a lot more interesting. And there's a certain point where it's just reading way too many Facebook posts. And it's like, I get it. It's like a comprehensive history. How many, how many parts is it right now? You would know this, right? How many? He is currently at episode 75. Right. See, that's what I was trying to say. Like, and this isn't me like trying to be antagonistic or being a hate, but like, you don't need to watch a 75 part documentary series on Chris Chan, honestly, at this point, it's like just completely, I don't even know how to explain it. I'm not trying to be a total hater about this because I understand like you say that, but people love this documentary. I know that's the thing. There's demand for it. People will watch it. And it's like, I, I get it. You know, the part there's a part of my brain that gets it. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, the, the part of the monkey human brain that loves gossip, the part of the brain that loves, the, you know, the tabloid thing at the checkout. You just want to see how fucked up someone else's life can be. And there obviously is an angle of like, how did they get this way? It is kind of a fucked up thing to wonder about. But I don't know. It's not that it, there's no value in presenting it the way he's presenting the story. It's just maybe a little too bogged down by minutia but then again you know like you said if there's demand for it who, who am i to say that they shouldn't exist yeah. <laughs> i don't know I definitely see your point it's, it's interesting i don't i don't even know what to make of it fully but a lot of what i've written the points i kind of want to hit on is the question of the impact of gino samuel's documentary because i find that interesting Chris Chan, A Comprehensive History, began in February of 2018. This is undoubtedly, like, I think most people now, it's their introduction to like, this whole story. Right. So like I said earlier, again, because this is how it was documented in the early days, the early episodes are like nothing, but I mean, I don't want to say nothing, but it's fast hitting. It's like, it's a highlight compilation of the cringiest moments. It's like the third time I've said it, but like, that's why the early episodes are going to hit you. They're going to hook people in because it's going to be like nonstop crazy shit. And like, it's almost like you have to be that densely documented to even understand what was happening. Yeah. But now now it's more just like, here's every fucking like email that Chris has ever written. I, re I remember, I remember when that series first came out, it was like insane because, you know, obviously a two hour video about like a two hour videos now, it's like nothing. Like no, no one really mm -hmm. looks at two hour videos like that's insane. Right. That used to be like, that used to be crazy long though. People there, used there, to. Yeah. Nowadays, you know, you get two hour videos about a lot of people. It's fine. But Gino Samuel doing a comprehensive fucking out. Each episode is an hour. This is like a Netflix documentary about Chris Chan was fucking crazy. Ahead of the curve in terms of just the algorithm and stuff. I remember uh, me and all my friends in high school, we would keep up with it and just watch it and just talk about it and just, just like, what the fuck is going on? Like, what is this? You know, obviously I followed Chris after the documentary. I, I would read the quickie, but you know, there's a level of detail that you didn't, this was the promotion of learning every single like little minutia about Chris. It's a look that you'd never seen before. You never knew this much about her life and you never knew this much about how much 
weird foreshadowing there kind of was throughout it. And all of the, the little itty bitty like things that carried over from childhood all the way up until adulthood. It, it was, it's that recontextualization again that Dash Sashima started, but Gino Samuel definitely followed through with a lot, a lot more. Like taking things like, oh, Chris Chan won this Sonic sweepstakes as a kid. In the context of the documentary, when you put it in like that kind of light and then it goes on and you talk about all these like traumatic events, you talk about Barbara and Bob's like different personal issues and like their failings as parents and you contextualize that and you see how dysfunctional she kind of grew up to be like almost immediately and how obsessed she became with Sonic. It's all of that, I think, that really made it so much more compelling than, you know, the Sachimo one did. Right. Like I always, when I think of that Sonic sweepstakes incident, it's less about the specifically Sonic, although like, of course, there's plenty of reasons you could hyper fixate on Sonic or whatever, but it's more just about like, again, not be throwing shade at like a literal like eight year old or however old Chris was when they won the sweepstakes, but like it was more about when you win something like that. You're spoiled. They, yeah, it's not even spoiled. It's just like they were you now that's person. This human being has like a baseline level of like entitlement where it's like, okay, if I enter a sweepstakes, I should win. I should get to be on television. And like, I don't know. That definitely, I'm not even saying like Chris was on a child star, obviously, but like that being a child star, that like fucks up your brain in like a similar way of just like the raw levels of attention you're getting. And another thing is like, so whenever you make a documentary about a controversial or like fucked up person, like you have to be hyper like aware of like, you know, not, you know, excusing them or glorifying them to any degree, but also not like, you know, you're not just trying to like, I mean, I guess some people are just trying to make a hit piece on certain people. So I guess it's not true for every documentary, but I don't know. You have to walk a fine line if you're trying to claim to be an, like an impartial observer in a situation, you know what I mean? Especially when in later era, you have direct contact with this person. That's definitely what Gino does the best out of, I think, a lot of these these people. I guess it's important to talk about this first, establish this first, is that upon Gino making his documentary series, emphasize just how many people became aware of Chris and became fascinated with this story, which is like presented with like, I mean, fuck, even the introduction, like having this original composition that like sets the stage of like, again, like what made him this way? What is the fascination? gripping it grips you into this story even if you know fucking nothing about you don't give a shit about lol cows you don't give a shit about trolling like it grips you and it makes you feel bad for chris to be honest it's a remarkably thorough series and it is like i said earlier it, it hits you with a lot of like funny and quote-unquote bad stuff chris did but in a way that is like i don't know i again it seems dumb to even say, but to even present any level of like empathy or human understanding was more than most people were willing to care about Sonic Chu. It used to just be all yeah. about the most amount of laughs you could get at this person. But it was so successful that like even I'm pretty sure he's he's said on streams before that like he's he's been reached out by people in like the film industry and stuff and like people who make documentaries for like Netflix. That's like wait, what the fuck? Like <laughs> you know? It's like wait, really? They're interested in Christian? But I mean that's not even surprising anymore. Like we, we kind of just accept that now. The day I turn on Netflix and and I see a, like a documentary for Chris Chan that's like official and like produced by Hollywood. I'm just going to fucking kill myself. <laughs> Not only did it get all of this attention, it started this new wave. Like, that's, that's a questionable thing. This is why it's important to establish that is it also arguably introduced the new wave of trolls, like all the people that kind of would surround Chris and that whole scene that kind of exploded after the fact. Right. When you thought it couldn't get any worse. Wait till you see these. Yeah. Wait till you see these people. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not. I, this isn't me being like trying to cancel Gino Samuel. But oh, like, no, of course, I, does he feel bad about like, you know, way more people have gotten eyes on Christian and therefore trolled the shit out of Chris Chan specifically because of their documentary. It doesn't matter how neutral you want to make it. When you're clearly presenting someone who's like, this is the most gullible, stupid fucking person in the world who will believe anything you say. And here's like scientific proof that that's true. And then be like, by the way, please don't mess with them. I mean, that used to always be such like a fig leaf thing on like the quickie. It was just like, by the way, don't mess with them. It's not allowed, but it's like, I don't know. Obviously, there were plenty of people who, you know, because this used to be a thing on Something Awful back in the day, which was it linked to shitty fucking websites like full of psychos, but they're very strict look, but don't touch the poop policy. And it used to not be that hard for people to stick to that policy. But I mean, this new generation, it's not, it's not all the new generation, plenty of psychos back then too, but I don't think these new generation people even has the pretense of pretending to do that. You know what I mean? One, one of the most clear examples of this is this guy, the Wildcat, also known as Sean Walker. Now, Sean was part of that group of people that just completely self imploded after the audio of Christine talking about what she did to her mom leaked. And one of those people was Sean Walker, who infamously was trying to alter Chris's fantasies to incorporate characters from the spree killer Randy Stare. 
which I remember seeing this dude because in the summer of 2018, like a few months after it began, Gino's channel was banned for uh, violating YouTube's terms of service. And you know, he ended up putting it on hold and restarting it after a year. But in the meantime, before he remade a lot of those episodes, this channel called The WCT re-uploaded Gino's videos. And that guy, you know, was Sean Walker. So that guy undoubtedly came from Gino's documentaries. And he ended up being so interested in the story that again, he went and began interacting with the subject. He wanted to become a part of Christory. Like, I think there were leaked DMs where he was like fantasizing. He was reveling in the idea of becoming part of Christory. It was right. like, it was genuinely kind of fucking Well, pathetic. there's one thing all these idea guys have in common is that they're all fucking morons. <laughs> it's like this, like the idea of Christory and like making internet history is like so attractive to these like degenerate, like like people who want to make a legacy Dude, as a that troll. that is so fucked up to even think about. Like, there are people who crave e-fame and attention above all else and they truly couldn't care less about anything and like they yeah. see christian the only thing they think about is how can i make this about me how can i make use this to make me famous and it's like it's not a new thing but good god there's some truly fucking deranged people out there like in that sense like there is like a thing to criticize Gino for. He's easily the best in keeping himself out of all of this. He ignores Christine's DMs. He ignores all of the the ops and stuff that goes on around him. Kind of like people, because people try to come to him with shit. But I think the real argument against him, if you are the belief that these are harmful, is that glorifying like Christie, glorifying all of this documentation is itself dangerous because you're encouraging people to begin interacting with this person and begin like trolling them so they can also appear in your documentation documentary and become part of this like bizarre internet phenomenon right you know? yeah that's sort of what i was saying like it doesn't matter how neutral you are the very act of making a documentary on someone is kind of inherently not neutral i just say like i i think he should make the documentary like I, i'm completely in support of him making this documentary I, I think it's a very interesting project i think it's better that this documentary exists than this documentary doesn't exist it's just unfortunately how it played out you know it's just the reality of how it played i hear out. you in terms of like at this point, especially at this point, but even like ten, five years ago, like it was inevitable. It's kind of stupid. I'm not trying to sound like fucking Thanos or whatever, but you couldn't avoid at some point someone was going to make a Christian documentary. I guess it's better that it's Gino Samuel. And again, you know, the whole point is like it's a free country. I'm not saying you legally shouldn't be allowed to, you know, make it. It's just like after the latest, the biggest, the new Christian news, not the late, you know, the thing with the mom. At that point, I was just ready for like, couldn't it just, can it just be over now? Can it please just be over and I never have to hear about this again? But like I said, I've just accepted that that's not going to happen. Personally, I feel like it's a little bit of a, there's a lot of a delusion that people have about like, I'm only consuming morally righteous content or whatever. And it's like, it's fine. You know, if you do want to, you know, you don't find it, you find this kind of stuff disgusting, you don't want to watch it. But, you know, the fact that, like, there is a level of immorality to Gino's documentary is not something that, like, I feel like is enough of an indictment personally to be like, oh, he shouldn't have made it. I think the documentation is worthwhile enough to justify it and the consequences of it are unfortunate. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's their fucking actions, you know? It's the fact of the matter is these fucking idiots. And, you know, who knows? Maybe if the documentary didn't exist too, maybe other idiots would show up completely independent without Gina Samuel's documentary. But the reality is that they watched his documentary and they ended up fucking Chris. They ended up fucking with Chris. Sorry, I it's a complete <laughs> misspeak. There. Freudian slip. I was just going to say that, like we were referring to earlier, with it being a cautionary tale, my the best hope for a, like social good coming from this is like every Zoomer who will watch this, they'll just be exposed to it. I don't know if it's going to just go viral on TikTok or do they just, I don't know how they find it. But if every Zoomer watches this, they can just learn like, oh, I don't have to put every single fucking stupid, embarrassing thing I did online because that's just like, you know, potential ammunition for future psychos to use to harass me. Like there's no better example of case of like why you should maybe try to retain some of your online privacy than this cautionary tale. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's hard. It's hard for me to to really view it in that lens anymore. Sorry, I was trying to just... take any positive spin off of this, uh, apart from the you know the raw entertainment value. Even like... I don't even know if there's a positive spin to be honest. I I just find it like at this point, I don't know. It's the same thing with reality TV. You know, everyone watches not everyone, but a lot of people watch reality TV. It's a completely immoral like form of entertainment a lot of the time. But it's a fucking train wreck that you can't you can't look away from. That's just how it is. I have to balance being realistic, obviously. I know it's just like this is just going to be the kind of content that people inherently are gravitating to so I guess it's better that it's you know handled by someone who actually kind of cares about doing a good job right yeah and, uh, and another unfortunate consequence I think of these documentaries is 
the, the idea of glorifying Christory didn't just, you know, make this big trophy for these trolls to latch onto. It was like a huge ego boost for Christine, which, you know, maybe wasn't a good right. thing. That's what I was saying earlier, way back when, about it all being a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is like, people would go get insanely mad at Chris for being like, entitled and demanding online, you know, money for free from strangers online. But then that was how she was making a living, you know, at the end, just getting money from people for like commissions or whatever the fuck. I, I don't even know the details, but the only reason that she could do that was because there were so many people giving her attention, which is just, it's such a fucked up weird situation. When Chris first became aware of the Sachimo documentary, which at this point, again, has 2 million views, so it, was, it wasn't something that was I think one of the highest viewed things with Chris Chan in it at the time. So definitely not something you could easily ignore. Chris became aware of it, but she refused to watch it until showing up on this podcast, I think with, it was called like the Internet Dream Lounge. It was there that the host was like remarking that Chris was a legend. Chris questions this label to which the host attributes it to the massive wealth of information about her life. That itself, I think, if anything, afterwards, she said that she would watch the Sachimo documentary, which is kind of where I was going into with that. That itself kind of shows the unhealthy relationship Chris has with Chris Tree, where when you realize you're the most documented person on the internet, when you realize that this many people care about your life, it's gonna... <laughs> It's going to give you a bit of an inflated ego and you're never going to have to really reflect on all of these behaviors that you're doing. There's a reason that when all of these orbiters and enablers who came from like all these people who played into her delusions and played into her fantasies, when they showed up, there's a reason she was so willing to welcome them all in. Obviously, without it goes without saying that it got way worse towards the end, but like Chris was living in like a weird delusional fantasy world for so long, but like anyone kind of would at that point. Maybe not, you know, anyone, but like so many weird it was such a it's such a weird life. It honestly might be contended for like the weirdest fucking life anyone's ever lived because it's just so much weird shit was going on and you know, being internet famous for being weird, it, it's it's such a strange reality. Like, I wasn't even trying to shit on her for taking free money from internet strangers. I mean, what else are you going to do with your unwanted slash wanted e-fame, e-infamy? I don't know. This is just an interesting note that I think I'd throw in there. Christine has a notoriously bad memory and also now uses the Geno Samuel documentary to remember stuff, basically. So it's in so much detail that Christine uses it to remind herself of what actually happened, which is kind of why a lot of interviews going forward are kind of pointless because like, oh, what do you think about this event? And she's like, oh, well, when I was watching it back on the documentary, it's like, OK, it's not really like that substantive. Yeah. Like I said, it's a level of bizarre recursiveness where it's like again it feels embarrassingly obvious and stupid to say it's like the Truman Show it's like imagine yeah you can watch a documentary about your own life to give yourself a refresher about the shit that you've forgotten about and of yeah. course I mean no one could even fault Chris for having bad memory like just in terms of, like no one could remember everything in the Chris Chan documentary the level of detail is so like obsessive she became a pretty regular viewer of Gino Samuel's series and she would leave a lot of comments and would even DM him and again he he's done the best he ignored all of this except one time which is when she came to him with the proposal of making a Gino Samuel Chu card, which is when he politely told her not to do that, which I think is <laughs> funny that that's the only interaction. Like, I could see why, but... Yeah, regardless of how you feel about the whole situation, I mean, you have to admit it is one of the most uniquely internet sort of things that has ever happened, right? Yeah, I think it's... Um, and you know, maybe I'll go into this after. Though I have a few points that I want to talk about with regards to there are a few other documentary stories that I find interesting and then there's also kind of going back to what we're talking about the idea of objectivity in regards to covering Christian because I think that that's a very nuanced subject I don't know if there is a way to cover any of this truly objectively you're definitely not gonna be able to get everyone to agree on what's considered fair or objective yeah but I don't know I, mean, I mentioned before that like a lot of them were explicitly to trick Chris a lot of them were explicitly to provide misinformation or misrepresent things until a certain point. Now, a lot of articles are being rewritten and having disclaimers to clarify what reality was. But I think with with a huge part of the story being about active involvement from trolls and all these different characters, it is interesting that we know so little about them and their lives. We know so much about Christine's parents. We know so much about random like gal pals and random teachers that she's mentioned offhandedly and like kind of slandered, right? But 
the trolls themselves, there's not really a ton of coverage of them. And I, I think that's an interesting element to it. You know, if you're, I think under the lens of like, oh, this is the story of Chris Chan. This is the story of how someone became this way. You know, like what made him this way? Again, from Gina Samuels documentary intro. It's interesting to point that out and then kind of not also reflectively look at the trolls. Like what, what made them this way? What made them want to dedicate so much time to fucking with this person? What are they doing? What are they up to now? You know, I mean, it does seem like a lot of trolls quite deliberately and intentionally, you know, did what they could to obfuscate their identities because, you know, it's like the exact opposite. Whereas Chris constantly overshares, sharing everything, making it so easy for the trolls. They had good reason to want to keep their identities more secret and shrouded and, you know, but it makes more sense. Like, you know, like we were saying earlier, I feel like a lot of the trolls probably did, you know, I mean, it's obvious, but like, I'm sure they, if you're, if you're out there trolling Chris Chan, you're probably not like a giga chat having the most epic real life. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's all these like rumors out there there about liquid chris that's really interesting mm-hmm. liquid chris and casey who were um, some people consider them the best troll there's like a video essay like the greatest troll ever the, the rumors are like basically talking about how they got married after the fact and then it was like this really miserable marriage i don't know if that's true that's just some fucking rumors but just it's interesting to kind of look at like okay we're, why were these people why is there like a 13 year old boy that all these people are like okay with like doing all this like you know talking about blue spike doing this like it's actually insane that the blue spike shit that was like the first time literally that was like the first time anyone was like are we going a little too far are we the baddies you know what i mean and if you know that incident that was an insane level for that to be like the we line have so many videos about about christian we have so many videos about the christian story not a lot of videos about the christian trolls you know i want to know more about that i mean if you're going to be dumb enough of a motherfucker to get involved with Chris Chan, then you should be prepared for people to start obsessively stalking you and like looking into your real life and like figuring out everything that you've ever done you know what i mean you're basically asking the for most it. well-known one in terms of like the most we know about one of them is fucking isabel loretta janky and she's a fucking crazy person <laughs> like i don't know she's like a psychopath again this is not me being like it was actually completely okay back in the day to troll Chris Chan, but like it started, like I said, with everyone, you could post the Sonichu comic, and of course, everyone was just going to laugh at it and have fun making fun of it. And then, you know, it's like easy to see, oh, and there's also a couple of crazy details about the author, you know what I mean? It used to be like like a slippery slope of getting into falling, like, like oh, I can't believe this about this one person. Can you believe this? Whereas now it's like, I feel like if you meant, like most people know Christian only know about like the most fucked up shit possible, you know what I mean? And then they're like still like, oh, it's time to get into this. Can't wait to get into this. Now, I find it, I find it really interesting too, you know, th- this is the thing about kind of proclaiming comprehensive history when someone's still alive. Firstly, the story's always going to be developing. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm more so talking about also a lot of the quickie is colored by Chris's own words and just going off them and kind of believing right. them. It's an unreliable narrator, sort of, in, in the t- sense yeah. that it's, tar- it's like, it's not a value neutral, information neutral kind of wiki in the first place. And on top of the wiki having its own bias, it's coming from the most unreliable narrator of all time, which is Chris Chan. So it's like, all this, so much of this information, people that, a lot of people hate Chris and they'll use information like, well, did you know that he did this in the past? And then it's like, well, it's like, whose word are you taking for that? You know what I mean? They don't even like- There are huge swaths of like information that we don't know about Chris's life that I think, you know, if you're you're talking about what made this person this way, there was firstly a never resurfaced psychological report from when Chris was still a mute, I believe. That that's never been surfaced. Again, I'm not saying like we need to go hunt these all down. I'm just saying like these are differences in kind of like objectivity and just talking about like the full picture of like we don't really know what made this person this yeah, way. Yeah, we have a couple isolated incidents from Chris's childhood, but it's like, oh, of course then you're gonna take those and extrapolate so much information then but it's like there's also the entire rest of their childhood there's so much information well even that even stuff we do know there's stuff that people gloss over there's an entire lawsuit that bob filed against the school where chris claims that she was like bad touched by like the principal or something we have no idea what that lawsuit was actually about we have no idea we don't we don't it was I think uh, the records are all gone, I think. Either way, we just we just don't know what that was. Why was Chris transferred to a different school? The belief was that it was like the fear of sending Chris to an institution more specifically catered to like special education, to people with autism. Right. There's a whole lot about the whole Chris Chan story that's more of just like, if you really take a step back, it's more of like a cautionary tale about having like 70 year old fucking lead addled boomer brain parents. You know what I mean? Not that you can do anything about who your parents are. But I mean, obviously, you know, most of the story is about the spectacle. But I guess from my my perspective, I'm, I'm talking more about like, oh, I don't expect Gino to like be able to get all this information. I'm not trying to say that. It's not like a criticism of Gino. It's just an interesting thought of like, 
so hard, but there's so much we don't know. I mean, all of the the stuff with Barbara and and Chris, like the fucking disgusting ass like fucking incest shit. We did not know about that, but looking back after the fact, there were all these different like little signs of like, oh, they were cuddling together after the house fire. They were just talking about like abusive stories from uh, Chris's half brother and or like Barbara threatening suicide when Christine wanted to go to a convention. It is kind of just to say, okay, so think about how insanely detailed the documentary already is. And then it's like, now that it's like, that was already as detailed as it was, as like as 70 fucking parts. It still has to, but you know, just by the sheer nature it, of like knowledge, it, it can't cover everything. It has to gloss over certain parts. And now the original person was going back and then like using that documentary to like color their own present when it's like presenting maybe like a flanderized sort of image of them in the first place. I, it's, it's just a strange recursive nightmare. <laughs> There'd be a lot of value to kind of understanding more of what, you know, people who interacted, like, like I'm not saying, but this is not a call to action. Okay, I'm just saying we're talking about like an objective documentary again i'm not blaming gina for not doing this because this would involve yourself more in this whole thing but you would want to talk to more figures than just kind of going off the word of trolls and chris you would want to talk to people like um let's say like the people who worked at that school maybe people who were in the community when chris was growing up people because there there are points where chris apparently where the family had to move over alleged like rumors that were being spread by neighbors this is never elaborated on either and i think it's like what we're seeing is the warped output of someone who has been fed a ton of things by their parents and then eventually escaped into like this obsession with pop culture before being manipulated by all these trolls. What is closer to the objective truth is we have to look at, we have to get kind of the word of someone who isn't that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it is. Like one of the, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying not to get too philosophical about it. It's kind of hard to say you can never even really know anyone le- without knowing their whole life story. So it's like, I don't yeah, know, to even yeah. present that you can, it's kind of, it's strange. Like, I don't know. This is no fault of Gino. It's just, this is just, I'm thinking out loud of like, it's interesting the concept of someone being the most documented person on the internet and we still really know so little. Okay, I mean, the funny thing is like, what what is even the goal? Is the goal to fully understand the mind of Chris Chan? Is that, do you, why, why would you even want to do that? It's like, if you could somehow like spend the rest of your life like in like a hyperbolic time chamber watching like the next, the 8,000 part series on Chris Chan, you would emerge and be like, I finally understand Chris Chan and then you would kill yourself immediately. No, I, I would never, like this is not like the basis for why people find it entertaining i would never say this but i do think there is value in the sense of like the chris chan like spectacle is the worst case scenario of all these different like the end point of all these different people people who live on the internet for voyeurism a person with untreated like kind of mental illnesses not really getting the help they need and then never growing up never having the proper avenues to address them it's that person being unrestricted on the internet then then the documentation of this the concept consequences of turning into a spectacle reality tv all of this i feel like it's so much more evident it's so much more clear in when you talk about christery and you talk about why christian is so interesting and christian's actual story than any other example you know even reality tv i don't think it's as clear because this is a very internet specific story i don't think this could have happened on just tv is why it differentiates it from reality tv even though it's like motivated by a lot of the same underlying interests on that perspective it's, it's interesting as a case study and Chris herself is also indicative of that. Just a very specific type of person being able to live out everything online and kind of the complete failure of parenting, the complete failure of, say, like social institutions potentially, but also a complete personal failure of like, you know, not to remove all agency from Chris, but just complete malfunction at every level, basically. I think that is very fascinating. And I think That's why, like, when I'm talking about, like, all these different things of, like, what is the bigger picture? It's, like, a community seeing this in its early stages. What do they think, you know, in real life? I think those are always the most interesting parts of uh, that whole story to me is before the internet took a hold of Chris, there were all these stories of people who also observed Chris. Like there was this uh, girl, she wrote this journal about him called like the tale of the crazy pacer. And it was just about when he was just walking around. I mean, he never would have gotten famous if that one random person just was like, I have no interest in this and walked away. You know what I mean? It's kind of yeah, crazy to think about. It's very interesting to analyze it on every level as a case study. But again, I'm not saying this is like justification for why this needs to keep happening or anything. That's like not why people are interested. They're interested because they're entertained by 
by it. There, there is a sick voyeurism to a lot of it and just it just entertainment to a lot of people, like a passive thing to follow. I, I understand that. It's just, that's kind of just another aspect to it that I find interesting. Yeah, not to interrupt your grand thesis, but I agree like what you said. It was, it's a very internet story. So it's very, it's like the first of its era to truly be this level of it and to be like this weird feedback loop where the trolls kept fucking with Chris. Chris kept doing weird shit, which would like enrage slash amuse the trolls. It was a weird situation to begin with and yeah, not to absolve them completely of responsibility, but it was like crazy to think like we, like I said earlier, we could have just had a different reality where Chris just had zero infamy, zero fame. And I don't, I'm not saying they would stay base level Chris forever, but just there's no way they'd be this fucked up. I think everyone can agree with that, right? I mean, it is crazy. It is like a case study of how bad shit can get. This makes me want to write like a screenplay about like an alternate reality where there's like someone else who's like the most fucked up person online and everyone is just like constantly transfixed by how fucked up they are. And, and like, it's like, oh man, I can't believe it. It's like, thank God that's not me. Thank God I'm a hard worker and that's not me. And it turns out this Chris Chan was actually just a CIA plan just to keep people in line. I was thinking that like Imagine if Chris Chan was just a troll the whole time, was just a fake lol cow like a Jace Connors. It would still be a perfect case study in like internet sadism. Very bizarre. Right. It is a. Uh, it is just one of those things that's almost too fucked up to even imagine it. But yeah, it is truly just quite the... I have to agree with you, and that's now we've talked about it. Like, not just not the history of Chris, but the history of how people have reacted to Chris has changed a lot. Because, like I said, I was there in the early days. There were not anyone in those threads being like, come on, guys, let's cut Chris a little slack. That didn't fucking happen back in the day, okay? So if you're one of those people now who's like, you know, thinking, well, I would have stopped it. I would have stood up for Chris. Well, you're, you wouldn't have, or you didn't, so fuck off. Now, there were all these people, so going back to Chris Chan documentaries, there were all these people who did videos about Chris, but there was always one avenue left unexplored, which was actually going there in person and talking to Chris and talking to people who knew Chris. I was going to say that going there in person, people did that. There were some people who drove by the house just to take pictures, but to actually talk like, like to another human being, not that many of those, apart from like call the house for do a prank call situation. Yeah. The first significant example of someone actually successfully doing this was Christian versus the internet. Do you remember this at all? Uh, vaguely. This is a project from 2019. It was a documentary by this guy named Joseph Draft. It was announced out of nowhere with like a trailer on Kickstarter. He asked for $20,000. Oh, right. Okay, I do remember this now. Yeah, it was like a big high produced trailer. It was like, yeah. oh, we're gonna do the real documentary. Not like as opposed to Gino, but just like we're going to do like the interviews. Like that's, you know, like you were saying earlier, like most real documentaries do interviews. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like interesting because he interviewed Barbara and he also interviewed Megan Schroeder, who hadn't really talked about any of this candidly for like 10 years at that point, I don't think. Right. It is crazy. Like if you could, if you were just like barely even remotely acquaintances with Chris back in the day, you're like a major figure in Chris Street. I have a bunch of fucking weirdos tracking you down. Yeah. To, like, ask you questions or just harass you for no fucking reason. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why you're listening to this if you don't know, but Megan was one of Chris's original gal pals who she was just really creepy with until she stopped being her friend. And infamously, that included drawing pornography of her, which was then posted to Encyclopedia Dramatica. Again, this is why it was so easy to dunk on Chris, because it was like constant layups of like dunking on someone for doing the most socially inept thing you could possibly do. That's the thing. Christine was always kind of like a creep, <laughs> like kind of a sex pest, like to be honest with you. Right. Especially back in the day. That's why people, I mean, I'm not saying there should have been people coming in every thread defending Chris. I'm just saying there weren't. And it's easy to understand why, especially if yeah. that was the only info we had back then too. It was like I said, a greatest hits of all the most embarrassing shit you could possibly imagine. Now, you know, maybe unfortunately, this documentary never came out because it got huge backlash on Kiwi Farms. This culminated in, I guess, a bunch of trolls manipulating Draft into, I guess, doxing himself or something. And the footage all existed on one hard drive, which he then destroyed with a hammer. So <laughs> this, yeah, this doesn't exist anymore. So this this documentary is just like gone forever. It's forever lost media. Man, that's a little melodramatic. I can't wait to smash a hard drive with a hammer. No, no offense, but if you're smashing a hard drive with a hammer, that sounds like something you do when the feds are about to raid you for some unspeakable acts I can't mention yeah, on this I don't channel. Know what they did to him to make him do that it's really like insane <laughs> just cinematic parallels to chris smashing their playstation 3 or whatever the fuck and then interestingly while that was happening a completely different documentary was in the works that also sought to do a similar thing and kind of meet up with chris in real life and that was the gamer from mars documentary which was which came out just over a year ago the christian conspiracy did you watch that one yeah you told me about this right because uh yeah like you said there was exclusive stuff in there 
I had did. some involvement in this one in the first episode and I helped edit the trailer. I didn't have like a, I wasn't like the main writer for this or anything, but just because I work with Gamer for Mars, I had some involvement in this. Now, it's interesting because most of it is like a halfway point. It's like longer than the Sachimo documentary, but shorter than the Geno Samuel one. It's like four hours long. So it's more in depth than a lot of previous efforts, but not too in depth where it's kind of intimidating to go into it, you know, if you're an outsider. Right. Yeah, I understand. Four hours seems like an insanely long amount of time, but it is just so much fucking stupid shit that happens. You don't understand. But the real draw were the, the, the every episode begins and closes with live action footage from when Gamer from Mars met with Christine. And this is pretty much like Kind of like one of those like Louis weird weekends kind of thing where it's just like this normal person reacting to this insanity surrounding them. So I don't know. It's fucking crazy. Have you seen any of this? I vaguely remember some of the interview footage. I have to say it is funny. Like there were so many people like there was a period of time before I don't know, this was like 2018, 2019, where you could just get constantly. I would see people get like selfies with Chris at like conventions and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And now it'll do, there's like it used to be not even weird to like see those on my timeline. Now it's to like, be clear. The footage was not recorded any, it was like recorded like 2019, 2020, I think. So it was a while ago. This was not recorded after the That footage aged like a fine wine though, in terms of like, you know, yeah. hard to get, people want to see it. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy footage. I would definitely recommend anyone listening to watch it, if not just for that, because Gamer from Mars walks in and there's just these screaming dogs. They scream like Bloody Mary. It's like insane. It's so fucking loud. To calm them down, Christine like stomps upstairs and just goes like, be quiet or something, like just starts like loudly making a scene. Oh my God, it's like fucking, it just looks like fucking hell to be Truly there. Lynchian. And then uh, there's another scene where they go to an Indian restaurant, I think. And then Christine does like an Apu voice, which is just, <laughs> this is crazy just it's just very unique footage it's just very unique footage i don't know that's mm-hmm. i just wanted to bring kind of that up just because those are kind of the four significant chris chan documentary stints Sachimo, Gino Samuel, Christian versus the internet, and then the Christian conspiracy. I mean, you mentioned there's a Turkey Tom one. Yeah, okay, like, I didn't, didn't have involvement in this, so I don't even, I haven't watched it, but I think we're at the point where we've kind of had enough of the documentaries that are just recounting the history. Now, that video I, has, has, has like over a million views. It but... doesn't matter how many we've had, like, it doesn't matter if we've had enough of them, as long as the videos like that keep getting views. They're gonna get, they're gonna keep coming out, though. We're gonna see more of them. We're gonna see more of them forever until Christian dies and we're gonna see probably a professional one after that but i guess my point is like there's not like i don't know if there's anything to say about it you know there's not like new info in it that's that's really what i mean i think we're at the point where there's not really any documentary efforts that are going to offer a new perspective the same way that kind of statumo did at first right i get what you're saying there's not going to be another long form one like if you want a long form one go to gino samuel if you want to like a more base overview you have so many choices so it's like i don't know like i said they're, they're not going anywhere if we can't all agree to just give up and stop talking about Chris Chan, then I guess this is what we're going to have to accept is the future. And I'd like to ask you the hard question, okay? This is, this is, I think, the note to end this all on, which is Gino Samuel asks, you know, what keeps us fascinated? And what do you think keeps the internet fascinated with Chris Chan to this day? Like you said earlier, you sort of touched on this. It is like, it's the most like fucked up a person could possibly be. Well, it's, it's kind of gone off the deep end now, but for a very long time, it was like, this is the most fucked up I can imagine a person like being, but like, I can also sort of understand that like, oh, that could have been me. Like if I went down a different path in life, that could have been me. I mean, maybe that just hits harder for like sonic freaks like me, but I think there's plenty of nerds online who can see that and just be like, it helps you identify your own sort of just behaviors and then. At a certain point, I don't know, like, regardless of how you feel about the whole situation, there's enough, like, random, like, amusing, just crazy stories in there that, like, that gets you, like, hooked. And then, I don't know, it almost feels wrong to say parasocial, because that sort of has a different connotation. But, like, people start to just know Chris Chan, and then in their life, like, oh, it's like a cartoon character. It's just, oh, what funny thing is Chris gonna get into this week? People have a weird attachment to Chris Chan. I think that goes without saying, obviously, but, like, specifically, even, like, people who aren't actively malicious or fucked up about it, they still have a weird connection, you know what I mean? It's hard to put into words. Yeah, there's a certain point, I think, like, let's let's talk about like MTV, there was a point where there were people that became celebrities, and then they became famous 
because they were celebrities. They were like celebrities because they're celebrities, you know? Maybe there's an initial thing that boosted them to that position, but after a certain point, they're famous because they're already famous and you keep hearing about them. And Chris Chan is probably one of the most prime examples. It's the perfect example of that because so much of the modern, I think, motivation to stay interested in Chris Chan is because, oh, well, they're the most documented person on the internet, in internet history. And so because of that, we have to keep documenting them. It's like, a, you were saying before, it's like the self-fulfilling cycle. And I think that is true for a lot of really all of these different machinations that continue to keep us fascinated with this story. It's that the reason we care is just because other people care. And then it just keeps going because the fact that they care itself becomes like this weird degeneracy that just slowly feels more degeneracy in this constant just loops over and over again. All right. Not even getting into the people who are like on the sunk cost fallacy. You've just been following for like 10 plus years. So it's like, it's not even like a conscious thing for them to do. I guess they just keep track of it. I mean, I like I said earlier, you don't have to try and keep track of it. Anytime Christian does fucking anything, it's going to trend on Twitter now. You know what I mean? It's not going to be something you yeah. can avoid seeing or hearing it's about. ridiculous. Fucking Christian showing up on Tucker. It's uh God. Yeah. What a, what a future, what a world we live in. But yeah, no, I know what you mean in terms of just, it is just a strange story. And it's like, you know, you kind of just have to accept that it's going to keep happening. You're going to keep hearing about it. So you might as well have some informed opinions about it. So when can we expect your video on Chris Chan Cyber Show? <laughs> people, well, not Chris Chan specifically, but Sonnet Shoe. People always ask for videos on that. No, and, when, uh, when can we expect the three hour Sonnet Shoe Net Lore episode, the bonus episode? Um, you know, it's, here's something to think about. Here's something to chew on. The kind of things Chris Chan originally got, like, internet famous for wouldn't even, like, get a blip on the radar nowadays. If someone else comes out, oh, look at this crappy webcomic. It's not just wasn't even a webcomic, but, like, look, whatever, you know, like, look at this crappy comic. Look at this, you know, spur know I, acting like I a weirdo. Like, time. it's so tame. Again, I, I, not to blame everything on TikTok and Zoomer is, like, some kind of old man, but, like, that wouldn't, like, if, if you're scrolling your TikTok, if you, like, the most egregious thing Chris Chan did back in the day, they're not even gonna give a shit. That's not even gonna impress them. Like, the only people getting famous famous nowadays like Chris Chan are people who are like somehow even more fucked up and deranged you know what I mean so it's like I don't even know if we're ever going to see anything quite like Chris Chan you know what I mean obviously there's other quote unquote lol cows or whatever you want to say but like there is something unique about this fucked up situation which it's hard to ignore it's hard to quantify no I can that that's a good point I don't I don't know <laughs> I don't have anything to add to that that's just you know, it's a good note to end it Yeah, on. it is. It's one of those things I could talk about for hours, but in like an ideal world, I would never talk about again. But people, some people can't help. Like I said, it's like a train wreck. You can't help but look at it. It's fascinating in a grotesque way. We should do a documentary about Christian documentaries. What are we doing? That, Why didn't we, we just do that? And then, and then after that's done, we can do an episode on Christian documentary documentaries. That'll just that's be the true. next era. It's like, like a hundred years from now, we're going to people documenting fucking Gino Samuel's life just because he was remotely. Yeah, watch involved. out, Gino. We're going to gonna start the Gino Samuel a comprehensive history dude that would be it would be so funny as like a bit to be like and then Gino Samuel said this and then you just read the like video script verbatim from one of his Christian videos that'd be like the fucking the greatest way to steal content ever it's like then he uploaded this video <laughs> that's the next level of react content it's like this is a documentary about this video and it's like and then this happened and they just like play a clip from the video all right I don't know how to end this episode. Yeah, that's 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 our podcast guarantee. We don't know how to start episodes and we don't know how to end episodes. And frankly, we don't even know how to do the middle part either. But, you know, we did we shit out something. Like I said, if you didn't know, we this was like a last minute episode. We we're like, oh, maybe let's do something next week. And then we, we both had like potential subjects planned for another episode. And then Bernie was just like, no, let's do one in an hour. I got a good, good subject. I didn't even know what it was. But no, that was a good talk. I felt like we touched on some stuff. I have a script and outline that I'm preparing for an episode about Windy City Heat. But currently, I'm very very busy with a bunch of bunch of different videos that I'm working on for both myself and other people. So Right. We we've, we've been busy. It's hard to prioritize net lore because we're just sort of doing this on the side for now. In the future it would be nice to be able to do it more regularly. I can't like promise a weekly episode, but we'll try and get them out semi regularly just because uh, we get we actually have people listening to the podcast. It's like a it's like a real podcast or something. So yeah guys if you support net lore, okay, you like the podcast and you want to hear more of it, please keep listening. Please keep leaving comments. You know, we do really appreciate it even if you disagree with our takes it's, it's interesting to see what you guys think um share it with your friends please okay guys please please think about how cool you'll be if you stroll into your new friend like group your group con group text whatever it is a real life room if you're one of those people you're like guys i have the coolest new podcast we can listen to together <laughs> but i really i think we both really enjoyed recording these we really enjoy doing this podcast it's just and just 
would like to do more of these, but it's just, it's hard to kind of prioritize it just right now because again, it's a side gig. So again, if you guys want to see more of this show, you want to hear more episodes, support it in any way you can. And really, If right you're now, listening to this in the future and we have a Patreon, then fucking give us money. But if we don't, then just give us your attention. For now, it's just helping us make sure that there's an audience for it and that right. you're interested in seeing more. You couldn't just launch a Patreon with like the first episode. That would have been stupid. Okay, that concludes episode five of NetLore. Thanks for listening. Uh, goodbye, guys. Episode six, never. See you next time. And if I don't see you next time, I'm going to fucking find you and I'm going to fucking break your kneecaps.